Thank you very much. Uh, let me just make sure my mic. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, uh, well thank you for having me here. Uh, my presentation is maybe about 30% about data, but it's 70% about education. Uh, and I want to thank Microsoft for giving me the opportunity to speak to this crowd about the work that we do. Uh, you know, I run a nonprofit called code.org. Most nonprofits come talking about a problem uh, and then try to get you all sort of excited about you know, th this problem that we need to solve. I actually think about what we're doing is about opportunity and unleashing America's untapped opportunity. Uh, I want to start talking about it in the terms of a personal story. Uh, this is a picture of me growing up uh, when I was little. Uh, that's me on the left. Uh, it was me and my twin brother. We grew up in Tehran, Iran, and I lived there during the time of the revolution, and a war broke out with Iraq, and you know, I spent most of my childhood days kind of in the basement while there was planes overhead bombing our city, uh, and it was really not a great place to grow up, and I didn't really have a lot of hopes for where I would end up in my life. Uh, but my life arc changed one day when my dad brought home a Commodore 64, uh, and you know, back in the early 80s, this may have been the only personal computer in the entire country, uh, and he gave it to my brother and I and said, you know, th this thing doesn't have any software or games on it, but here's a book, and you can learn how to write your own games. It's called Basic, and you can learn this and make your own apps, et cetera. And like many others, uh, at that same time, I learned computer programming, and by the time I came to the United States as an immigrant, uh, you know, I was way ahead of my fellow students and friends, and so while they were busing tables and, waiting and working at gas stations, I'd get summer jobs as a 16-year-old as a writing computer programs for new, nearby uh, tech companies, and I was basically on my way towards living the American dream, and I've had a fantastic career in tech as a result. And I want to say, you know, the American dream has changed quite a bit. Uh, you know, it used to be the American dream was about going out west and building a log cabin and, you know, panning for gold in California's rivers. But these days, the American dream is about being the next Mark Zuckerberg, the next Kevin Systrom, building the next game-changing technology. And also, technology has changed quite a bit. Uh, when I started, you know, computer programming was basically around that Commodore 64, and then eventually, and you know, largely about programming a computer. Uh, but with the advent of smartphones and also the advent of the cloud, computers are touching everything. Whether it's medicine, whether it's energy and smart thermostats, whether it's space research, entertainment, uh, transforming transportation with self-driving cars, or contact lenses you can put in your eyes that measure your glucose, there's almost nothing you can think of that isn't being changed by technology. And so getting back to the story of me from you know, over 30 years ago, there's a question I have about what, are, what is life like for today's kids at the same age? I want to introduce you to two kids. This is Armand. He lives in Washington Park, just north of Harlem in New York City. Uh, he's in fifth grade. And this is Rahel. She uh, lives just about five miles south of here in the Highline District in South Seattle. Uh, neither of these are great neighborhoods to grow up in. They're definitely better neighborhoods to grow up in than uh, post-revolutionary Iran 30 years ago. Uh, and 30 years later, these, the schools these kids go to don't teach computer science. And you know, I have a question of what does a career look like for these kids or for a student entering elementary school today, starting kindergarten this fall, they'll graduate in 2030, what will their careers look like? I used to tell people that unless you want to flip burgers when you grow up or drive a truck, every, anything you want to do is going to be you know, impacted by technology. It now turns out there's actually robots being designed that flip burgers, uh, and uh, trucks have been announced that know how to drive themselves. So, and that's today. So what, what's gonna, it's going to be like in 15 years? What will life look like for these kids if they don't get exposed to these technologies? Now, since I run code.org, you know, you can see computers are changing everything, and most schools don't teach computer science. However, people assume I'm here to say that our kids should be learning to code. That's actually not my message, and that's not what our nonprofit is trying to do. Our goal is that our schools should be teaching computer science. Uh, and even though you know, my hat says code, uh, our view overall is about computer science. And coding versus computer science is it's a little bit like comparing grammar to English. Uh, and computer science is broader than just learning one syntactic language. It's about learning about big data. It's about learning how the internet works and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about computer science. Uh, 
one giant misconception is that computer science education is on the rise. We all see everything that's happening in the world around us, technology and all these startups. It turns out that computer science education is on the very recent recovery after a 10-year decline. Uh, this graph shows computer science graduates in the United States uh, over the last 12 years. And you can see the number we're at right now is still lower than where we were in 2004. And there's half as many women graduating in this field than just 10 years ago. So you know, this is not a problem that has been you know, growing. And like, you know, the, the, the more opportunity is, the more students there, there are in the field. It's actually been declining at the same time as opportunity has been created. There's another misconception that the reason people are talking about this is because the tech industry is desperately trying to hire computer programmers in California. Uh, and the reality, as I'm sure you all know, is every industry is desperately trying to hire computer programmers everywhere. Uh, here in Washington state, the picture is particularly bleak. Uh, currently, there's 20,000 open jobs for computer scientists in this state. Uh, this past spring, 1,000 CS graduates graduated from universities in this state. Uh, and at the K through 12 level, only 62 schools teach computer science across elementary and high school in this state. Uh, that's just bleak numbers, but these numbers are basically the same in almost every state in this country. Uh, you know, in Missouri, there's also 20,000 currently open jobs for computer scientists. Uh, in Pennsylvania, there's also 20,000 open jobs, and those states actually graduate fewer students uh, than you know, some of the more advanced states from an education standpoint. Uh, and the reason that I focus on elementary school and K through 12 is students don't study this in university if they don't get exposed to it in high school. The high school is when you decide what things you're interested in. Um, if you look at the job picture nationwide, there's uh, the, these are both charts from the Uni United States government. The top line is a projection of jobs coming from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, so 1.4 million jobs over 10 years. The bottom line is the projections of graduates from the National Science Foundation. The delta between them is a million jobs over 10 years. These are literally the best paying jobs in the country and the best paying college degrees. And the salaries added up add to half a trillion dollar economic opportunity. And whether you care about helping the US economy or national competitiveness, or helping you know, the lower class reach the middle class, or just giving an economic social opportunity ladder for people, this is a very transformative way to do that. That said, this isn't only about jobs. Uh, it's about educating our kids. Uh, one thing I like talking about, though, is the STEM problem. How many people here have heard of STEM as in STEM education? Uh, all right, great, many of you have. It turns out two-thirds of Americans have never even heard what that means. Uh, it means science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, but if you look at the STEM field, uh, more than 60% of all jobs in STEM are in computing. And just under 10% of all graduates in all STEM fields are, tr are studying computer science. So we have this giant mismatch between what we're telling students that they should be studying and what our schools are teaching and where there's actually economic opportunity and, and social value added to the country. So and this mismatch basically is causing this situation where in most of STEM fields, there's actually too many students and not enough jobs. We have too many social scientists, too many psychologists, more mathematicians than there are jobs for mathematicians. In almost every STEM field, there's an excess of students and not enough jobs. And then in computing, there's this crazy excess of jobs and not enough students. Um, now, computer science isn't just about jobs. It's not even just about technology. Uh, fundamentally, it's about logic, problem solving, and creativity, which is why we should be teaching it to kids young. Uh, just to put that in perspective, you know, this is a picture of the first computer from 1943. Uh, I'm sure all of us know how to use this thing. Uh, this here, in comparison, is the first computer programmer and she wrote her first computer program 100 years before the fir first computer even existed. Uh, Ada Lovelace, uh, as you may have heard, wrote a theoretical program for the, uh, the Charles Bab Babbage theoretical computing machine. Uh, and I love this because of two things. One, the first computer programmer being a woman is awesome uh, in a day when people you know, think that female computer programmers are unicorns. Uh, but then also, secondly, it shows that this is a field that really does uh, it's not just about technology, it's about problem solving and creativity. Uh, and most importantly, my biggest message to schools is that computer science, on the one hand, is vocational. It leads to these best paying jobs that impact every field. Uh, but at the same level, it's also foundational. Uh, you know, when I went to school, every single student would learn about you know, the insides of an animal and the digestive system 
every single student would learn about how a basic electricity circuit works, uh, and every student would learn things like the Path Pythagorean theorem. And it's just assumed that if you're going to be an educated human being, these are things you need to be taught. Uh, and there's still the things that every single school teaches, uh, but I believe in the 21st century, it's equally foundational to learn how an algorithm works or how the internet works. Uh, these are, there's nothing that says that these things are less important or less foundational in this day and age uh, as the world around us is changing. Uh, so the real question is, can the public education system evolve? You know, we have this trillion dollar a year public education system in this country. Uh, when you ask most people in America, how do you feel about America's public education system, you know, they don't immediately light up with smiles and you know, get all excited about how innovative and agile our education system it is. Uh, they usually kind of grumble and, and you know, don't have a very positive opinion. Uh, but I believe public education can evolve and you can actually look in history and it has evolved. You know, school used to use things like the abacus for teaching basic math. This is how people learned math a long time ago, and nowadays everybody uses a device that didn't even exist 60, 70 years ago. Uh, and so really the question is, how do we get computer science taught in schools? So we started our work with a movement called the Hour of Code. Uh, the Hour of Code is a, a grassroots movement with hundreds of partners to get hundreds of thousands of teachers to introduce just one hour of computer science into the regular school day. Uh, and the idea behind one hour is just to begin participation for both the student and the teacher and the parents. Uh, I wanna play a very short video when we, uh, basically that we came out with almost a year ago leading up to the sort of the, the computer science education week climax of the Hour of Code last year uh, to talk about what this, uh, this movement is about. teacher says you guys are into it. We are. It's very awesome. Code.org has partnered with 30 public school districts across the country, including New York, Chicago, and Denver, to provide lessons in teacher training and writing. The largest education events in history. Organizers set what they called an ambitious goal, reaching 10 million students this week. Almost 15 million signed up. This week, I'm proud to join the students, teachers, businesses, and nonprofit organizations taking new steps to support computer science in America's schools. They've been so excited about it. You're learning and you're playing. I got it. I ran an hour of code that's easy to do. They're learning how things are created in a technological world, and that's their world and their upcoming world. Every district should do, every district can do it. I'm actually seeing the kids in elementary school start coding, and this is amazing. I'm so excited! I'm actually gonna code! You love it? Yes, I love it. <laughs> it's coding super fun? Yes! If you can change technology, you can change the world. I challenge girls in every single country to learn one hour of code. Computer science can unlock the best opportunities in the world no matter where you are. Please help us get the Hour of Code to 100 million students this year. And my school's doing it. So that was about uh, 10 months ago, we were at 40 million uh, hours of code have been served. Uh, as of earlier this week, we've reached 122 million hours served, which is a fantastic success. Uh, and this isn't just a success for us, this is a success for schools, because uh, most of this work was done in schools, not people at home. Uh, and also, this started out as an American uh, movement, uh, but quickly a lot of other countries uh, basically came and, and supported the same movement and decided this is something that's international. Uh, so this is a map of all the, you know, each of the dots in this map is either a school or a place of learning where students have done the Hour of Code or people organize an event. Just to give you a sense of uh, the density of this, this is if you look at the United States and just the eastern seaboard, there's a lot of dots. Each one of those dots has on, or, on average 30 to 50 students doing an hour of code, and many of them are schools where the entire school for 1,000 students did it. Uh, 
just to show some of the international support for this, uh, this is a map of Europe. Italy went crazy uh, and, in fact, was the densest country in terms of uh, learning to code. And they're now using our curriculum as part of the uh, built-in curriculum for all schools in Italy. Uh, and those of you who live in Seattle, this shows all the schools in the Seattle area that did the Hour of Code. Um, now, I'm not here to talk about one hour of learning because one hour is not very much to learn much, uh, but it's still really exciting in terms of changing stereotypes. For example, in one week, we had more students try computer science by far than in the entire history of the field, which is a fantastic achievement for anybody who cares about the gender gap in computing and in computer science and technology. Um, now, people ask me, what can you actually learn in one hour? Uh, first of all, we teach kids that programming a computer is fun and that you can build things that involve cute characters and we also include characters from entertainment things that they recognize and they immediately sort of get excited by that. The second thing they learn is that coding doesn't involve or doesn't need to involve learning about semicolons and angle brackets and syntax. Uh, most of you who do professional computer programming do need to worry about that stuff uh, but when you start learning about it in school you know it all involves dragging and dropping and so getting some character on a screen to do something mostly involves dragging and dropping the code for what they do. And these days, even at schools like Harvard and Berkeley, the introductory computer science classes start with dragging and dropping code, figuring out how to build the logic sequence before learning the syntax. And then lastly, teachers learn that you know, kids can very quickly learn to make cool, creative expression art type things. And when making something like that, you learn not just about coding, but also about things like the angles and geometry. And it's a lot more fun to learn about geometry when you want to create something like that than in a multiple choice question that just shows you a bunch of angles and asks you a question about it. And so harnessing kids and humans' inner desire for creativity is a great way to get them to learn. Uh, I want to give you a quick demo of one of our tutorials. Uh, this is probably one of the world's most popular learning to code tutorials. Uh, oops. So this shows you the first few steps of the hour of code. Uh, you can see the angry bird on the screen, and he says, you know, help me get to the pig. Uh, and this over here shows the commands he knows how to do, and this here is his program. And so when you hit the run button, he needs to move forward twice. So you can drag a move forward command, and now he needs to move two steps forward. And it says, congratulations, you just wrote two lines of code, and you can see the equivalent JavaScript for the code that he wrote. Uh, and you know, just having that small success of getting a pig hit by a bird gets kids started writing their first line of code. And then this here, now they can write three lines of code, and then soon they, they learn to, you know, put together more complicated programs. So you know, to get this bird to get to the pig, he needs to move forward twice. But then kids need to figure out, you know, is it turning left or right? Uh, and they commonly, you know, this just teaches you to think coding is about giving the computer instructions from its point of view. Uh, people also regularly turn right and then don't move forward again uh, because they don't realize that when you talk to a computer, you're literally talking to the dumbest possible device uh, imaginable. And unless you tell it exactly what to do, it won't do it the way you want it. Uh, but this is something you can learn even as a six-year-old uh, and appreciate it even when you're 30 or 40. Uh, and you know, when, with blocks, you can start making really, really simple programs, but you can get much more complicated by adding more logic as well. Uh, I'll skip the video of this, but this basically shows a repeat block, which is basically a for loop, and you can repeat five times moving forward. And as any of you have done computer programming know, you know, the moment you can do a repeat of anything, something can happen five times or a million times or a billion times, uh, and it unlocks a lot of power. Uh, and, the, and the beauty of computer programming isn't... And you can see, of course, this also has a for loop and teaches you these basics. And the beauty of teaching kids computer programming this way is they don't need to learn about typing and capitalizing and tabs and semicolons. They just learn to put together the logic pieces and solving puzzles. It feels like a game. And they literally come home telling their parents, I love this thing. And their teachers also realize this is a lot more fun than math class. Uh, and uh, they end up integrating it into the curriculum. So for us, having gotten over 100 million kids trying that, the real question is what comes after the hour of code, because in one hour you can do that and have fun. Uh, and for us, what comes after the hour of code is basically integrating this stuff into the school system. Uh, to get back to the students I 
talked about Rahel, who's uh, you know just south of us in South Seattle. Her entire school now teaches computer science, uh, and she's one of the first students enrolled in an early computer science class. Her goal is to become a doctor in life, uh, but to use technology to improve medicine and to help save people's lives. Uh, Armand, who's in fifth grade, his teacher did the hour of code, but the kids loved it so much that she ended up doing 20 hours of ongoing exercises using our tools. Uh, his goal in life is to be a Navy SEAL, uh, and if that doesn't work out, he wants to be a computer programmer. Uh, <laughs> To give you a sense of the things we do besides the hour of code, you know, we spend a lot of time, we have an entire engineering team, about 15 engineers, working on creating fantastic online courses that combine an IDE and tutorials in one. Uh, we've forged partnerships with many of the largest school districts in the country. Uh, we're training teachers to integrate computer science into the curriculum, and we're also changing state policies. Uh, some of our metrics are success. We now have six million students uh, who've created accounts to take full courses in computer science. Uh, we're in partnerships with all of the largest school districts. Uh, these districts all together represent 15% of the, the entire uh, student population of the country. Uh, we've trained 10,000 teachers and we've changed policies in 18 states. Uh, this has been amazing just because this entire thing started less than two years ago. So uh, for two years change, almost any nonprofit with numbers like this would be excited. And for us, this excitement isn't because of the work we've done. It's because public schools are actually embracing this uh, at a time when you'd think schools don't do anything, they don't change, and they're not innovative. This change is happening because teachers understand it. Teachers want this stuff. They recognize it's important for their kids' future. And they're just doing it, and the school system is sort of catching up with them. Um, Another really exciting thing, I want to sort of delve into the six million students. Uh, some stats on these kids. Uh, these are kids using our Code Studio platform for learning, uh, which was launched uh, less than two years ago. We now have 140,000 teacher accounts on the system. Uh, and of the six million students, they represent 10% of all students in this country who've now registered uh, in just in the last year and a half. Two million of them are girls and two million of them are black and Hispanic students. Uh, to put that into perspective, this country as a whole has 500,000 female software engineers, uh, and our schools at the university level graduate 8,000 girls a year. Uh, we have 4,000 girls signing up every single day learning to code at much, much younger grades, you know, playing with Angry Birds and Anna and Elsa from Frozen. Uh, but if even 1% of these girls decide to graduate and major in computer science, we'll completely balance the scales of, of the gender gap and also the, the ethnic race gap in technology. Um, this is generally a picture of our diversity across our students. Uh, the female, the boy-girl uh, population is almost balanced uh, relative to population, and the African-American and Hispanic chart is actually perfectly balanced. Um, the reason we achieve these diversity numbers more than anything else is we're starting young and integrating this into school. Uh, you know, most kids who learn this stuff out of school, it turns out, are following their stereotypes or more likely their parents' stereotypes. When it happens in school, you don't really have a choice. You know, third grade teacher just says, this is what we're all doing, and we're all doing it, boy or girl, and we end up reaching a balanced audience. So uh, this has been a fantastic success from the standpoint of changing the color and the face and the look and feel of who, who does computer programming. Um, I want to show a quick demo of the tools we're using beyond sort of the early elementary stuff to show you how uh, much more complicated stuff can be taught in school pretty easily. Uh, I'm going to show uh, something called our App Lab. Uh, oops. So this is basically a design environment for making simple apps. Uh, this over here is where your app runs. And I'm going to start designing a very, very basic app. I can put a text input over here. And I can drag a button over here. I can put a canvas over here. And this is all inside a web browser, which is really important because schools don't have IT teams. They don't like installing software. Uh, and you can very sim simply start creating an app and then assigning code for this app. And the code here can use drag and drop, so I can do things like you know, setting my active canvas to that canvas that I just made. And then I can trap events. And if you look at this, I'm actually dragging and dropping JavaScript. And I can you know, create a little JavaScript function that gets called when the button is clicked. Uh, and then this is the cool part. I can switch from blocks directly into typing and start 
typing stuff. So I can say variable number equals get text of text input one. And you can even drag and drop into the JavaScript uh, and run things like a for loop and for i equals zero to four. I'm not really sure what I want to do this with this, but uh, I can go from zero to num and then draw a rectangle from something to something, I don't know, from zero and i times 20. I don't even know what this will do, but we'll see what happens. All right, so that drew a bunch of rectangles on top of each other. Uh, uh, it obviously is doing something. Uh, I, didn't, I just kind of picked those numbers out of, out of a hat. But what's also cool for kids after you make this is you can very simply share it and type a phone number, and it'll automatically send that to your phone. And since it's a web app, uh, and as you notice, this little play area that we're in is the size and shape of a phone, uh, you can basically get that exact same thing on your phone. So that the time it would take for a kid in a classroom to build something that they then get on their phone is extremely compressed. I did it in about five minutes, but we can get kids to build apps as, as similar to an Instagram or a Snapchat as a ho homeroom sort of school assignment that takes just two days. Uh, and if in two days you can build something that does something like Instagram and Snapchat as a kid, it blows your mind, especially if you're you know, living in a poor neighborhood where you have no other route out other than being either a gangster, a drug dealer, or a basketball superstar. This suddenly gives you this other completely different route out of your, your life. Uh, now, the kids who've been doing this stuff have now written 7 billion lines of code. Some of this is JavaScript, some of this is dragging and dropping. Uh, and to talk about data, these 7 billion lines of code give us a huge amount of data. Uh, we now have 6 million student accounts and 10,000 joining every day. Uh, every single time somebody hits a run button, we save the code that they ran. Uh, we also know if it was a puzzle that they were trying to solve, like the thing, the bird trying to get to the pig, we know, did the bird get to the pig or not? Uh, and we also know, did they use the optimal code for doing that? You know, did they use the for loop to get six steps ahead, or did they have to go step, 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 which is longer? Uh, and that gives us a whole sort of level of insight into how human learning works, because you can measure how long does it take for a kid to solve a puzzle, and if they make an error one way, what can we do to teach them how to fix that error, and so on. Uh, we are just scratching the surface of trying to even understand this data. Uh, I want to show. Uh, a little bit of research that Stanford did using some of the puzzles uh, that we uh, put together. Uh, so this basically shows a graph of students trying to solve a puzzle where each dot on the graph is a uh, is a piece of code that a student ran, uh, and then they change it, and then they run it again, and they move to another point of the graph. Because as you know, when, when anybody is coding, some people get the right answer immediately, but most people try something, and then they make a mistake, and then they change it and fix it. Uh, down at the bottom right is the correct solution. Uh, every other dot on the graph is incorrect solutions, uh, and kids basically sort of uh, try these out until they figure which one works. Um, but to show you how the, this chart works, it's a, a cool little animation showing all the kids start at one place. And then you can see the different things they try to do. Uh, and these are all basically the size of these circles are, the si are basically populations of students. And you can see different paths kids take in terms of their learning as they edit their code. Uh, and then which paths end up reaching a proper solution. Uh, and all the sort of leaf nodes that end off at the side edges are basically incorrect so solutions where a kid gets stuck uh, and doesn't find their way back. Uh, this is just done with solving one puzzle and, and you know, millions of kids trying to solve the exact same puzzle gives you this picture of basically what it takes for kids to learn stuff. Um, it's really pretty, although I don't know how to actually do anything with it to make our system better because uh, you know, this is mostly a pretty visualization. Uh, but what's cool is we can take this type of data to then feed back into hinting systems so that as kids are learning and they make a mistake, we can generate smart hints because we know that you're over here on the graph and what would be the next, you know, the next change you should make to get 
back onto a path where you learn, uh, or we can identify patterns in the most common mistakes kids make to figure out what type of cognitive issue they have. Maybe this kid uh, is having trouble recognizing patterns in loops, or maybe this kid is mixing up their right from their left. Uh, you know, there's lots of different types of patterns you can see and then use those patterns to guide uh, the learning and, and maybe show them an appropriate video or so on. Um, in case you're interested, we've already made a whole bunch of the data from our puzzles available at the URL down there. Uh, and this, this you know, big data dump from just about a few puzzles in our Hour of Code tutorial. Uh, we're planning on releasing all of the data from all six million students and hundreds of hours of tutorials uh, in an anonymized way. Uh, so if you go to that URL, there's also a little email sign up form to hear when we release that data as well. Uh, and this is data that we're gonna make open for anybody basically to do research on uh, and we'll likely publish the top questions we'd like help with ourselves. Uh, we're a very, very small team uh, and we actually don't have any data science uh, expertise. Uh, so our hope is to get other people to help us answer the questions for us. Um, Another thing we're doing in terms of stuff with data is not only do we have data on the students, we also have data linking every student to their teacher and even every teacher to the teacher trainer. Uh, and we then you know, run these systems to train these teacher trainers. So this is a very unique because in education, you, know, you hear about accountability and you know, is a teacher a good teacher or a bad teacher? You don't really know. Uh, and then there's all this test taking to measure the teacher. When the stuff is done online, you know, we're, we're building online learning systems that are used in the classroom in regular school, not just for homework or for after school, uh, which means we have full measurability of what the teachers are doing in the classroom and what the teacher trainers are doing. Uh, and the way our teacher training works is you know, we have trainers across the entire country and teachers basically go to their workshops and when they go there they create an account, they get linked to whoever trained them so we can track what happens in their classroom, uh, which gives us a, a particularly unique view on data and helps us optimize our teacher training as well. Um, I want to mention something about our teacher development workshops because to the extent any of you want to help with our overall purpose, uh, this is something people can help with as well. Uh, you know, we have workshops that are highly, highly rated by teachers. Uh, if you're familiar with net promoter scores, uh, which is the, the industry standard for how people measure you know, wh whether somebody likes your stuff, our net promoter score among teachers is a 90, which is extremely high. Most, you know, in the tech industry, the highest net promoter scores are Amazon and Apple's net promoter scores are around 70, uh, and it's on a scale from negative 100 to 100. Among teachers, our net promoter score is 100, uh, sorry, is 90. Uh, and we've partnered with all these major school districts to host workshops around the country. Uh, the, our most common workshops are for elementary school teachers, where any teacher anywhere can basically show up and learn to integrate computer science in their classroom. So if any of you uh, either have kids or no kids or know anybody who's anywhere near elementary school, please ask the teacher to attend one of our workshops. Uh, and they can visit code.org. It's free. It takes only a day. If one teacher attends one one-day workshop, for their lifetime, they'll have at least 150 or 200 kids that learn to code from that one day that, of time that they spend. Uh, and you know, we have over 1,000 teachers every single month going through these workshops. We're trying to double that number to 2,000, and the best way they spread is through the word of mouth. Uh, so after the work we've done over the last two years, uh, you know, I showed you that graph where computer science was on a you know, recent recovery from a 10-year decline. It's now the fastest spreading course in, in public education. And in schools that do teach computer science, they're seeing record enrollment by students. This here is the graph of the AP computer science exam, uh, which is the college board exam in high school. Uh, right about here on the exam is when code.org launched. Uh, so we see the enrollment numbers are going high, very high. However, the problem is still we have a long way to go. This exam at the high school level is only taught, or this course is only taught in 5% of US schools. 95% still don't teach it. Uh, the elementary school courses that we've put together now have 10% of US students enrolled. The other 90% still don't have access. Uh, so we're growing very quickly, but in a field that we still need to 10x in terms of how we do. So we have a long way to go. Uh, 
This wouldn't have been possible without a whole lot of people who've supported us. Uh, you know, not 100,000 teachers, millions of students, parents, and lots of businesses. Uh, I want to especially thank our largest donors. Uh, our largest donor happens to be Microsoft, because I, I used to work here and had good enough connections. And I wanted to thank Microsoft in particular for their generosity, uh, as well as Google and the Meteor Network and many, many other tech companies who've supported us. Um, I think that's it for my talk. Oh, wait. One last thing, which is how you can help. Uh, if you're interested in data, which I'm sure you are, please check out our data at the URL I said, code.org slash research. Um, the other thing I would say is buy our hats and t-shirts. Uh, uh, we don't actually make money from our, the swag that we sell, sell. The reason we sell it is to help change culture and to help kids think that this is just something that's mainstream. Uh, our hats have now been worn by Jessica Alba, by Ashton Kutcher, by Carly Kloss, and also by the President of the United States. Uh, so, you know, we've tried very hard to get coding to be something that is switching from being the super nerdy thing it was when I was in school to being cool enough that celebrities are willing to, to you know, wear it proudly on their heads. Um, this hat happens to be the actual hat that the president wore, which is pretty cool. Uh, he unfortunately did not want to keep it, so I was <laughs> very happy to <laughs> take it right back. Um, and then lastly, please refer an elementary school teacher uh, to code.org to integrate uh, coding into their classroom. Uh, and then I'll have to say the obligatory thing, which is if any of you are interested in helping in this stuff, we're looking for software engineers, and we're particularly looking for data engineers. Uh, we have this boatload of data, and nobody at our uh, company actually has expertise in how to use it. Uh, so if any of you are interested, please get in touch with me. Uh, that's it. So thank you very much. And I'll answer a few questions if you have any. All right. Let's hear it for Hadi Partovi. <laughs> thank you, Hadi, for that great talk. Clearly, he's doing something very, very noble. Um, my first question, uh, given that this is the Pi Data Conference, is you showed me a whole, whole lot of JavaScript. What's the story with Python? <laughs> Surely, when people get to high school, you want to make sure you, they, they, they learn Python, no? Yeah, we get asked. By far, the number one question we get asked at code.org is from students saying, what's the first language I should learn? Uh, and we get a, tons of arguments from teachers and computer science to saying what we should be teaching. Um, I would actually say Python is the most popular language we're told we should be teaching. <laughs> and the reason we teach JavaScript isn't because of its ease of learning. It's because of the number of platforms that have the runtime built into it. Uh, for sure, Python is easier. You don't need to worry about your, your curly brace matching. Uh, but you know, our, the first language we teach really is just the drag and drop stuff, uh, which teaches you all the concepts. And once you've learned that, I think switching from one language to another is pretty easy. In fact, the drag and drop tool that we use, it could spit out Python just as easily as it spits out JavaScript. Uh, and so once we finish with our courses, we may actually make the Python equivalent of them as well. Uh, because it is, at the end of the day, just syntax. I totally understand. We just had to tease you about that, given that this is Pi data. Anybody have any questions right there? Sure. Sure. The question was, do we have interaction with US First Robotics, which does similar kind of stuff? Uh, US First does after school programs for robotics. First of all, we, we're in education. We're a nonprofit. So we love all other efforts that do good things in education. Uh, we have some differences with First. They do more robotics. We do just software. Uh, uh, and the other thing is US First is an after school. And I chose to do the hard thing of getting this into the real school curriculum, uh, which involves a lot more stuff. Uh, an after school club, one teacher can do it, but every student doesn't enroll, just the ones who want to get enrolled. Uh, and then they need to, you know, in a school of 1,000 kids, maybe 10 kids will take the after school program. Uh, our big advantage is because we've managed to tap into teachers who want to put this into the real school classroom, a school of 1,000 kids will have 1,000 kids getting uh, exposed, which ends up leading to those diversity numbers. Uh, but you know, the coding that we're doing which, with that drag and drop stuff, most people who do robotics camps, the coding that they do also starts with drag and drop. So uh, you know, they'll learn about it in, in the classroom, and then they can go to the after school thing and build more cool stuff. Next question. I was just with, with you know telling things to how to move from their perspective. I was just curious if that was a influence or if that's just a coincidental similarity. Yeah, the question is, were we influenced by Logo? We were totally influenced by Logo. I, I didn't learn Logo when I was young, but uh, you know, 
Logo has been, there's, there's a number of things. Logo and Carol the robot are some of the oldest, uh, they're 30 years old, uh, ways for people to learn this stuff. And a lot of what we're doing is just basically bringing those, make, modernizing them and making them a little bit more mainstream. Uh, and if you've heard about our tutorials featuring Anna and Elsa from Frozen, it is basically a logo programming thing where Elsa, the ice princess, is making ice fractals, but really she's just drawing lines. And we thought Elsa would be more appealing than a turtle. Uh, nobody ever understood why a turtle would be drawing lines. Uh, but El since Elsa does create ice fractals, and she has a superpower to make them, and we think today's modern superpower is learning to code. Uh, but it's really just a skin for the, the same models as before. And in fact, the people who invented Logo are still in this field doing this stuff, and we work with them. Uh, you know, they haven't gone away. Uh, any qu more questions? Yeah, over there. So can I, if I made two questions, one is, Thoughts around cross-disciplinary um, technology education, so teaching doctors how to code uh, and things like that. Second question is around the education curriculum itself. Thoughts around changing that from being in, I mean, I come from Australia, but it's 18 years of a student's life. Given the rate and pace of technology and access of technology, I think that can be reduced or altered in, in a way to give more practical learning Sure. Yep. So there's two questions. One is about cross-disciplinary learning, and I'm a big believer in cross-disciplinary stuff. Uh, and you mentioned doctors learning to code. You know, I think the intersection of healthcare and technology is probably the most amazing thing that's going to transform humanity over the next 30, 40 years. Uh, and the only way you get people to do cross-disciplinary stuff is if they even are aware that they could do it. Uh, and the reason we're teaching computer science is you know, at the high school and middle school level is when you learn about all these fields. Uh, and it's harder to become cross-disciplinary if one of them is in that black box of secret stuff you know, never tra touch. Uh, you know, most of us live in a world where there's an expert in one field, but then they need to talk to the computer programmer. Uh, and every field is looking for these like magical unicorn computer programmers because they don't know how to do it themselves. Uh, but if you get this taught into elementary, middle, and high school, everybody will have at least the foundational knowledge or at least be able to talk to the computer programmer, let alone be one. Uh, and I think it's very important. Uh, your next question was about changing even just the 12 to 18 month sort of cycle of, of curriculum and education. Uh, I think technology will help make that happen. It's not my personal goal. Uh, you know, changing the school system is hard. Uh, but for us, what we do is we try to change the school system on the school system's terms uh, and to basically bring computer science into the classroom kind of the way other things are taught. Uh, but one thing is really important about how we do it, which is that you know, the way most things are taught in school is you go to a lecture, and the teacher gives you a lecture, and then you go home and do your homework or read the book and then come back to the lecture. Uh, and computer science is different in two ways. One, there's computers in the classroom, and you actually do stuff in them in the classroom, much like a chemistry lab. Uh, but the other difference is that the computer can actually start giving you some of the lecture and giving you some of the learning. Uh, and as soon as you have the computer actually guiding you to the next thing, the teacher's role stops becoming one of being a lecturer and becomes more of a facilitator. And once you get into that world, you can get into things like personalized learning, and then you can start accelerating the faster kids at their pace and so on. Uh, all of that starts by getting computers into the regular school classroom. And we are by far the largest deployment of curriculum delivered via computers straight to classrooms. There's many other efforts that create online curriculum that is used at home, like Khan Academy or Coursera or edX. Uh, we are by far the largest that actually is bringing these into classrooms, so it's like the real school system is working that way. Now, our courses don't have any personalization yet. We're collecting all this data that we could use to personalize the pacing, uh, but we don't do that yet. Go ahead. There's so many questions we'd like to ask. Um, you know, I have some really simple questions like, you know, comparing learning between girls versus boys, between kids who have a teacher and kids who don't have a teacher, and then if we spent money to train that teacher, did their students learn more or not? Uh, that's actually really important to us because we're spending millions of dollars on training teachers, and if it moves or doesn't move the needle is really important. Uh, so those are simple types of questions. Actually, even measuring learning is not an easy thing. You can measure if a kid solved a puzzle, 
did they learn something or did they just follow the hints? Uh, you know, th those are types of uh, sort of questions. Uh, then there's a whole bunch of insights that can be fed back into the system, which aren't pure questions, but basically what would be the best hint to give a kid if they're stuck? From, you know, we can actually, a you know, we have enough kids doing this stuff that we can A-B test, you know, when they're stuck here, give half of them this thing and give half the other thing and see how many of them solve it, go to the next thing and have, have actually learned what it took to get past that. So, uh, you know, we actually have an area where people can crowdsource, uh, you know, we've had the same exact puzzle tried a million times. So there's a place that shows, you know, 100,000 kids made this mistake in their code can you give them a hint just for that mistake? And we have this area where people are basically crowdsourced typing hints for the next 100,000 kids that make that mistake. Uh, and then judging whether those crowdsourced hints are better than algorithmically generated hints is another interesting data problem. Uh, so uh, tutorials are about to start. Could I ask the people that have further questions to come up to the podium? And for those that want to get ready for their tutorials um, in the various room, please look at your program schedule and uh, We'll see you at the tutorials. So thanks again, Hadi. That was great. I also have five code.org hats if anybody wants them. All right. So for the first five.